Hey guys, Mr. Swobland here. Um, this is our video for the next unit, which is covering cotton, cattle, and railroads. So in Texas history, all three of those things have been really important throughout our beginnings. Cotton became a very large crop in Texas. Um, it was a pretty big crop before the Civil War, and it would become even more important after the Civil War for Texas. Cattle production was something that had been important for Texas since we had our Spanish explorers um, come through Texas in the 1400s. And one of the really cool things is they left cattle behind and those cattle would grow on to become large herds of cattle that would become the basis of the Texas cattle industry in the 1800s. The last thing that we're gonna talk about is railroads and railroads played an important part in Texas although we had a lot fewer of them than other parts of the country. All right, here we go. All right, so the cattle industry in Texas really had its origins with our Spanish explorers. When the early Spanish explorers came to Texas, they brought cattle with them because they wanted to be able to raise meat to eat themselves. And realizing that they were going to colonize New Spain, um, which Texas was a part of back in the 1400s, they left breeding pairs, a male and a female cow, along all of the major, major river crossings that they crossed while they were exploring Texas. And over the course of the next 400 years, these um, cattle would grow into large herds throughout Texas. And the Spanish did this not only with just cows, but they also did it with horses. And that's why we had so many wild horses or mustangs in Texas um, during the early part of our journey as a country and then a state. Um, Texas is really well known for having cowboys, but really how we think of a cowboy life is nothing what it was really like. When we see cowboy movies, for the most part, we see like cowboys depicted in small towns where they're fighting other people, maybe fighting in Native Americans or fighting some lawmen. But for the most part, being a cowboy was nothing really like that. You lived on the trail you would be um, bringing up cattle from a place in Texas, usually up to a Midwestern state where there would be a large railroad junction. Um, this was really dangerous work. As you can imagine, right, you're sleeping outside all of the time. There's a lot of snakes. Um, cows and horses can both kick and kill you or break your arm. And breaking a bone back in this time period could very well be a death sentence. Um, and this was a job that was really mostly done by young people who men who were about your guys' age. So 12 to 15 years old was a very common age to be a cowboy. It's not something that people would want to do over the long term. People weren't paid very well to do it. So people, when it has very low wages and dangerous working conditions, it's not exactly a ideal job for everybody. Um, we did have a lot of cowboys come up from Mexico to work in Texas. Um, vaqueros are what they are called. And we also had a lot of people from Texas becoming cowboys. And we had a lot of African-American men who came to become cowboys after the Civil War, after all of those men um, and women were emancipated or made free. A lot of them continued, came to Texas looking for work, and some of them became cowboys. Um, like I mentioned, the cattle industry in Texas really has its beginnings with the Spanish exploration and conquest of Texas and New Spain. So by the 1500s, the Spanish had built out large cattle ranches throughout New Spain, and this was also true in Texas. Texas provides a lot of areas where we have large grasslands, and this is perfect for raising cattle. So by the 1700s, the Spanish were really using a lot of these cattle to support their mission system. So they would use the cattle for beef production, for milk, um, making cheese, things like that. So it became a really important food source for the Spanish who were living here. Um, the regions that really saw a lot of cattle growth were the ones where we have good water supply and plentiful grasses. So in the plains regions we, is where we saw a lot of the cattle being raised. Texas is also really known, well known for our longhorns, and longhorns are a specific type of cattle. They're very distinctive because they have the giant horns, you know, why we call them longhorns. Um, it's a type of breed of cattle that was developed by the Spanish, um, and it was mixed with English cattle that was brought by U.S. settlers. The longhorns are very well suited to living in Texas. Um, they 
exist on the natural gas, grasses pretty well. And they can also go long periods of time without drinking as much. So it allows them to endure both hot and cold climates. And as anybody who lives in Texas can tell you, the weather here is so unpredictable. You need some cattle that can um, live in pretty much any sort of climate. So over time, the Texas longhorn developed into a new type of species specific to Texas. Um, one of the main things that we are going to have with cattle is the development of cattle trails. And there are four main cattle trails coming out of Texas, heading up into the Midwest, where they would meet large trains that would then bring the cattle northward. The cattle trails are important because they allowed the transportation of cattle from the ranches. So down in Texas, you can see near San Antonio, Bandera, and San Angelo. They would allow all of that cattle that had been raised out there, that was raised on ranches, to be brought northward to places like Cheyenne, Wyoming, Ogalia, Nebraska, Ellsworth, and Abilene, Kansas, or Sedalia, Missouri. And once all of those cattle got up to the northern areas, they would be slaughtered, put on railroad cars, and then transferred northward. So this was really the big industry that Texas had during the late 1800s and up until about the start of the 1900s. Texas really exported a lot of beef. We fed a lot of the large northern towns, and it's going to provide a lot of income for people living in Texas. Most of the meat was not eat, eaten in Texas because there was just not as many people here. For the most part, our large population centers in the United States during the 1800s are the northern towns, no, northern large cities. So places like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, all of those places have very large populations and they're the ones who are primarily eating the steak that is raised in Texas. But um, out of these four cattle trails, this is where the places where cowboys would actually go and have the cattle drives where they would push the cattle northward until they reached um, the cattle pens in the, at the end of the trails. The Western Trail um, was the most used trail. It ended in Dodge City, which you know is a pretty famous cowboy town in Kansas, um, but that was also a really large railroad junction, and that's why we sent our beef northward. All right, so now we are getting into railroads. Railroads are gonna play a really important role in the United States throughout the 1800s. Um, the Transcontinental, Transcontinental Railroad, which you guys learned about last week, was the railroad that united the East Coast with the West Coast in the United States. And this is really going to fundamentally change the way our country exists. We're no longer a bunch of separate cities, but this is going to make us more interconnected than we've ever been before. You have to remember a journey from the East Coast into the West Coast would probably have taken you six, six to eight weeks before on horseback riding along with a like a other group of people on a trail. But the Transcontinental Railroad means that you're able to make that journey in a couple of days. So it's really going to fundamentally shift our connect how, how we're connected throughout the United States. So like I mentioned, um, the, this is really going to change us from being a society that transports primarily through covered wagons to being a society where people are going to tr be transported by the railroad. And it's not only going to be for people, but this will also be for goods. So as we start to have the more and more railroads built out, it means places like Texas, are able to export our products, in this case beef, to large northern cities where most of the people who are buying stuff live. So it's really important for an entire economy to be able to transport goods from one place to another. It allows you to develop an advanced economy. So Texas is going to use these railroads to transport key goods to northern cities. The main things that we're transporting are both beef and cotton. But like I mentioned earlier on, Texas really does not have the same amount of railroads that we find in northern cities. Most of the South was very much underrepresented with railroads. There were a lot fewer of them. And this meant that Texas had to have things like cattle drives to bring up that beef to places like Nebraska or Kansas, where there were large railroad hubs. And then once the beef got to those areas, it would be able to be transported. Cotton was a little bit different. It was usually shipped by sea to a place where there were railroad hubs. 
One of the really big inventions that we had during the 1800s that's going to completely change things for Texas is the development of refrigerated railroad carts. So like I had mentioned before, the beef that's being transported up to Kansas is usually, it's alive, right? Like we're transporting the cows, they're still alive, and they're going northwards on a cattle drive. Once they get to some place, they're going to have to be slaughtered, chopped up into beef that you would go buy in a grocery store or go buy for a butcher. The re refrigerated railroad cards are really going to change this. Prior to the, prior to the development of the re refrigerated railroad cards, beef would have to be transported live from Kansas all the way to New York. And you can imagine that takes up a lot of space. There's a lot of problems going on with having all those cattle on a train. And then once they get there, they're going to have to be slaughtered and um, made into something that you can sell in a store. But once the refrigerated railroad cars came into existence, a lot of that work could be done in places like Texas or Kansas, and then they could be transported to the northern cities and be not spoiled. So the meat would stay fresh because of these refrigerated railroad cars. So they will really revolutionize the way that Texas exports its beef to the northern cities. Um, by 1900, Texas does have a lot more train tracks. We're going to end up with about 10,000 miles of track in Texas in 1900. And it means that people across the state are much more interconnected. So a journey that would have taken you a long time on horseback, like maybe to some place like El Paso, now can happen much, much more quickly. You're able to get in a train and head, over, head down there in a matter of a day. New towns are being built along the railroads, and we'll see a lot of those crop up throughout Texas. Specifically, Frisco itself is actually named after the Frisco Line, which was a group of railroads throughout the South that connected a bunch of cities, um, and it ran through Frisco. So that's where the city of Frisco gets its name. Um, these are just some pictures to give you an idea of what places look like in about 1900. So you can see up top, Houston, Houston still is um, a very large city in the 1900s. It's not really um, hit its peak yet because we haven't had the oil boom. You can see San Antonio and Austin. There's downtown Dallas in 1900 and downtown Fort Worth in 1900. So just to give you an idea of what the cities looked like. There's still no cars driving around. People are still riding on horseback. You can see this is a little bit later of a picture showing you some of the railroads in Dallas. You can see, I know it's a little bit later because all the Model Ts are there. So we're looking at, um, oh, it says 1910. But this is, kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like in Dallas around this time period. All right, our last little section is on cotton. So Texas has had two main products that we export throughout our history. One was cattle and the other was cotton. Cotton is a plant that you grow outside. If you guys have ever been driving down the highway and you see a bunch of little white plants on the side, those are usually cotton plants. And they're um, a plant that we use to make shirts. We make clothing out of them. We make a lot of things made is made out of cotton. So cotton has been a really important crop that was grown in Texas. It's something that requires a lot of manual labor. A lot of our history as um, a Southern economy was based on slave labor picking cotton because it required so much manual labor. So um, cotton became a very large industry in the late 1800s in Texas. Te settlers really followed the railroad lines to find cheap land. Remember, it's really important to be able to get all of the product that you create on your farm to a market where you can sell it, which is in the northern cities. So you want to be close to the railroad so you don't have to like carry it as far. Um, cotton becomes very successful until the 1890s when it really starts to die down. One of the things that happened after the Civil War is a lot of our cotton, which we used to send to England, didn't have a, any place to go anymore. Um, that was because after the Civil War, England really turned to looking to India to supply them with their raw cotton rather than the United States. And so this meant that really um, cotton is going to largely die down throughout the southern U.S. over after the end of the Civil War. And we'll see that happening in the 1890s. So we really had a lot of, we were still growing a lot of cotton, um, and this is also going to drive the price of it down. So it's really, that will really be the end of the cotton and cotton growing industry in Texas. 
One other little cool thing that happened was the development of windmills. Windmills are a rotor that spins on because of the wind, and it actually creates a little turbine that pulls water up from the ground, so it creates a little vacuum pump. Um, this allowed for a lot more farming in places like West Texas, where we had it was much much drier. All right, guys, that is all I've got for you. So I hope you have a great week. Please let either Coach Wolf or myself know if you need anything. Um, yeah, that's it. Mr. Swoblin signing off. Have a good one.